The United Nations is trying to strengthen peacekeeping operations. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. Ministers and delegates from more than 85 countries and international organizations are meeting in Ghana for the fifth peacekeeping ministerial event. At a time when the world is facing many conflicts, the United Nations is trying to get countries to reaffirm their political support and collective commitment to peacekeeping. Earlier, I spoke with the UN Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, and started by asking him what are the goals for this meeting. This meeting uh, is very important to uh, the UN, and particularly to UN peacekeeping. Essentially, it's about uh, uh, making sure that uh, we see eye to eyes with our member states on the priorities, on the challenges to peacekeeping. And we think about ways forward, new ideas to address uh, what needs to be addressed. Now, what do we expect from this meeting? Number one, we expect a recommitment, a political recommitment from our member states to UN peacekeeping, a commitment to working together to improve further the impact and effectiveness of peacekeeping. Number two, we look at uh, this meeting as an opportunity to uh, devise new ideas, to think about new ideas and, uh, and, and new initiatives to complement or add to the work that we are already doing to uh, address the various challenges to peacekeeping. How can we make the better use of uh, digital technology? How can we further improve the role of women in peacekeeping? How can we further work on the safety and security of our peacekeepers and improve peacekeeping intelligence? I mean, these are the kind of challenges on which uh, we, want to, uh, we want to take stock uh, of the efforts that are currently made, but we also want to look at new ways and new ideas to address these challenges. The number three objective is about pledges. We are looking forward to hearing from member states about the pledges that uh, they want to make in terms of uh, new contribution, contribution in terms of uh, units and uh, military and police personnel, contribution in terms of uh, training, contribution of uh, in terms of uh, joint project uh, to uh, work, for example, on digital technology or, uh, uh, you know, safety and security. So these, these are the three objectives that uh, we want to, uh, we hope to, to be able to, uh, to, to reach in, uh, at this meeting. Right. And when we look at the continent of Africa, of course, this ministerial meeting is the first one of its type that's taking place uh, on the continent of Africa. Uh, Africa's peacekeeping role has been growing. Recently, we had Kenya, which offered to lead a mission to Haiti. What can you tell us about Africa's contribution to peacekeeping operations? Well, Africa is, uh, first of all, the continent when, where we have our largest missions. Um, and uh, we have the so-called multi-dimensional missions, uh, where the mandates are very broad, from supporting political efforts to protecting civilians to building state capacities. And we also have a very important uh, number of uh, African troop and police contributing countries. So definitely, Africa is a very strong partner to peacekeeping. Now, in addition to that, uh, uh, the uh, African countries are trying to work together so that they can also address the need when it, when it comes to peace enforcement, not peacekeeping, but peace enforcement. Uh, because UN peacekeeping uh, is adequate to certain situations where, as we say, there is a peace to keep, but where there is no peace to keep, then it's about enforcement. And the UN's view is that the UN, the, sorry, the uh, uh, African peace enforcement operations need to be better supported, they need to be better funded, and they need to be provided with the kind of capacities that they need. So, uh, and we are cooperating with uh, uh, the African Union and uh, African countries uh, very intensely to help them achieve that goal as well, together with uh, continuing their support and valuable contribution to UN peacekeeping. And what about China's role in uh, peacekeeping? China is the second largest financial contributor to UN peacekeeping operations. It also provides a significant number of troops. What can you tell us about Beijing's efforts? China is one of the 
biggest partner and supporter to peacekeeping, as you indicated, its role as the second largest financial contributor, but also in uh, its role as a, one of the biggest troop contributing countries. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we've always been able to count on the support from China to uh, the initiatives that were taken uh, to improve peacekeeping. And one of the uh, important examples that I would want to, want to highlight is the leading role of China on the very important issue of safety and security of UN peacekeepers. Um, it is, I believe, thanks to China that uh, this issue has been uh, given a very prominent uh, role and uh, a, a very prominent status in our efforts. Uh, so uh, we really count on China to, uh, uh, of course, be uh, represented at the Accra ministerial meeting, but also we count on uh, our uh, continuing uh, collaboration with China to help us uh, uh, implement our mandates, but also address the challenges to peacekeeping. And as you say, um, you know, the ministerial meeting that will take place in Ghana will look at devising new ideas to meet the challenges of peacekeeping and peace enforcement. There was an opinion piece which was published in Bloomberg, which pointed out, uh, uh, or pointed to rather, the successful United Nations mission in Croatia in the 90s. Uh, it said that could be a great example. Um, it points to the fact that the mission was heavily armed, fully in charge, with clear goals. I mean, we see several, many, in fact, conflicts around the globe right now. Um, what do you make of that opinion piece? Is that a good example that could be used? No. I think that certainly uh, peacekeeping operations should be provided with clear mandates and clear objectives. Uh, when the mandates are too broad, uh, uh, the so-called Christmas tree mandates, then uh, they're very difficult to implement because the resources are not adequate to this type of mandate, and it's really uh, setting peacekeeping up for failure. So that part is very important. But I would emphasize that uh, when uh, peacekeeping were at its most successful. Uh, it is where uh, the UN peacekeeping operation were able to support political efforts towards a durable solution that were ultimately successful. But uh, we cannot uh, be uh, alone in uh, bringing about this, this situation, this uh, successful outcome. Uh, we need more active and united support from our member states, particularly from the UN Security Council, to these political efforts. Uh, because ultimately, uh, the, uh, the, the, the best outcome for peacekeeping is to deploy, to support the political process, to see that this political process is brought to a successful conclusion and then leave and leave behind a much improved situation, which is what happened in many countries. Uh, you would remember Cambodia, Timor-Leste, or um, in Africa, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Uh, the list of these countries that were supported by peacekeeping is, is very long, but uh, for, from the UN Security Council to these political efforts, uh, because ultimately, uh, the, uh, the, the, the best outcome for peacekeeping is to deploy, to support the political process, to see that this political process is brought to a successful conclusion and then leave and leave behind a much improved situation, which is what happened in many countries. Uh, you would remember Cambodia, Timor-Leste, or um, in Africa, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Uh, the list of these countries that were supported by peacekeeping is, is very long, but uh, for that to happen, uh, there needs to be uh, a very strong commitment to our member states to support, actively support these political processes. So you act upon those decisions that are taken, uh, uh, these political de decisions that are taken by, say, the United Nations Security Council. When we look at, you know, some of the conflicts that have been in the headlines over the last few years, we look at the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Gaza right now. Can the UN peacekeeping missions play a role in this? Well, I believe that, uh, unfortunately, at this stage, uh, both the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Gaza are characterized by uh, hostilities. I mean, of course, we welcome uh, the uh, humanitarian uh, truce in, in, in Gaza. Um, so, um, you know, the, the question is, uh, what next? You know, what, what about the day after? But here, I believe that uh, uh, one can imagine uh, uh, 
dozens or maybe hundreds of scenarios, but it, it's very hypothetical at this stage. You know, there be mechanism to uh, support uh, the implementation of some form of uh, uh, cessation of hostilities of ceasefire. I mean, uh, it, it is possible to to imagine these scenarios, but at this stage, it's way too early to uh, to think of anything specific and 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 way too early to plan anything. Okay, sir, so we are going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. To continue our discussion, let's bring in our panel from New York. Victor Gao is a chair professor at Su Chao University here in Washington, D.C. Abdullahi Boru Halake is an Africa security and policy analyst. And Saeed Khan is an associate professor at Wayne State University. He joins us from Detroit. Welcome to all of you. Abdullahi, as we reported, this is the first UN peacekeeping ministerial meeting that takes place on the continent of Africa. Um, and as, we, as I just discussed with the undersecretary, Africa, African countries are beginning to play a larger and larger role in peacekeeping efforts uh, around the world. As we heard, Kenya uh, has offered to send peacekeepers to Haiti to keep the peace there. Um, what is the significance for Africa getting involved uh, around the world in this kind of mission? I think it's an important step in terms of African countries reclaiming their position, um, not just trying to resolve uh, various conflicts on the, on the continent, but also trying to lend the support. But I think at the same time, African countries would be well advised to know that going to a place like Haiti, for instance, for Kenya, it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be very challenging. But nonetheless, it's an opportunity for African countries, in this case Kenya, to learn how to do peacekeeping operation outside the continent. That's not to say that they have not done it in the past. We've got peacekeeping operation in, uh, in former Yugoslavia, where major various African countries were involved. But this one now, post Cold War, Cold War, uh, it is it is an important uh, step. And Abdullahi, what is the sort of political sentiment on these kinds of missions uh, in the countries of Africa? I mean, I know that's a general question, but is there generally support for it? I think there is uh, a place for African countries when, when, when peacekeeping operations are discussed. Uh, there, there is a fair degree of jadedness around them. You know, the largest peacekeeping operation, uh, that's the UN peacekeeping operation in the DRC, is still going on. DRC has not seen a significant improvement. I think one of the things that I really would want to put it out there is that we are seeing a major powers competition that is going on. And that is really making it very, very difficult. As it were, you know, troop contributing countries, largely from African countries, Asia, as well as Latin America, contribute the troops, and then Western countries fund those peacekeeping operations. Over the last couple of years, those peacekeeping missions have been transformed into what they call multi-dimensional peacekeeping operation, like the undersecretary has explained, but it is becoming very difficult. The Sudan peacekeeping operation, uh, UNMITAS, uh, its time is ending very soon. Uh, it's ended formally, but I think they hope they're closing down. Uh, Mali requested for uh, UN peacekeeping operation to leave the country because of the dynamic of big power competition. So I think the peacekeeping operation, as we know it traditionally, is going through serious, uh, it is under, under serious investigation and as such, um, we are heading into uncharted territories in that regard. Said, peacekeeping is perhaps one of the most important components of the United Nations system, if not the most important. Uh, what do you believe are the current challenges that this kind of mission faces? I mean, we heard one of them there from Abdullahi, where he pointed to the fact that in many instances, peacekeeping operations are hampered by major power rivalry. What do you see as the major challenges, and what are your expectations uh, from this meeting in Ghana? Well, of course, we always should keep a certain level of guarded optimism that with all of the kinds of violence and all the conflicts in the world that uh, cooler heads will, uh, will prevail. 
but more importantly that true leadership will will step up and i think unfortunately what we find is that there are several systemic issues dealing with the united nations uh, first and foremost it seems as though there's a contempt uh, among many uh, particularly in some of the great powers like the united states for the efforts made by the united nations on the one hand of course the uh, u.s is the largest uh, financial contributor to peacekeeping but it ranks 82nd according to 2021 estimates of actually having peacekeepers in fact it only has 31 peacekeepers uh, worldwide uh, China, out of the members of the uh, uh, the permanent members of the UN Security Council, by far has the most, uh, coming in at number ten with about 2,250. Uh, the U.S., the U.K., or the uh, U.K., France, and Russia uh, lag well behind. France and uh, the U.K. somewhere in the 600s. Russia uh, somewhere around uh, 72 uh, peacekeepers. So there's a real disconnect. On the one hand, giving money, uh, but being stakeholders when it comes to the kind of risks that are taken. Uh, being in the line of fire, which of course provides a different level of motivation for countries uh, that have uh, forces on the ground to perhaps try to move both by their presence there, but also through whatever kind of diplomatic leverage they can have and wield over the countries where they are deploying the peacekeeping troops. These are the kinds of combinations that need to occur and just simply are not happening with a system that otherwise could work if uh, there was perhaps a little bit more sincerity uh, and a little bit more openness and transparency to the processes of uh, what these powers are thinking. Said, you point to an interesting um, challenge there, and that is where you have uh, the developed countries which are prepared to put money up for peacekeeping operations but n are not prepared to put boots on the ground, it seems. Uh, do you think that might change after this meeting in West Africa? Well, it remains to be seen, of course. Uh, I would argue that uh, perhaps the best deployment of uh, some of the great powers into the field would be in those areas uh, where you find that conflict is perhaps not uh, as great, as uh, belligerent as it is in other places. Uh, for example, perhaps Haiti uh, is a place where uh, prevention of uh, some kind of conflict flaring up would be a good place for uh, some of these uh, developed countries to send troops on the or, uh, uh, forces. On the other hand, if we're going to be talking about a place like Gaza, uh, there has been some overtures about perhaps the United States, the UK, and France sending troops. Uh, that seems to be rather unlikely, first of all. And second of all, the trust dividend would really militate against this. Uh, the United States is clearly not seen as uh, an honest broker by the Palestinians, and so that would uh, not really be viable. And, of course, the U.K. and France are not too far behind, having, after all, over 100 years ago, created much of the climate that has then brought about uh, the situation in that part of the world. So there needs to be, of course, then those countries, and I think that the point that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Halaki made is a very important one. This is perhaps a good opportunity for African nations who do have credibility to then be well positioned. We have, of course, the specter of what happened in the Netherlands with uh, the Dutch uh, at Srebrenica. These kinds of things loom very large over those areas that uh, both desperately need peacekeeping, but also need to feel the kind of confidence and have the trust in those who are the forces uh, that are working with them. Victor, China is, of course, um, playing a very high-profile role in USP, UN peacekeeping operations, I should say, both in terms of finance and in terms of personnel, as we just heard as well. And China has long been a champion of the multilateral uh, global system. So how does China see the future of uh, peacekeeping operations around the world? Thank you very much for having me. I think China is very much dedicated and committed to uh, promoting the peacekeeping forces of the United Nations, uh, involving them in many of the very uh, difficult and challenging situations in different parts of the world. And China is, as you just now mentioned, one of the biggest uh, contributors, ranking second, as a matter of fact, and one of the largest uh, contributors of forces uh, among all the UN member states and the largest among all the permanent member states of the United Nations. I think China will continue to do that, and China will also promote more sophisticated management and deployment of peacekeepers of the United Nations, 
in different parts of the world so that they will be more up to standards and also try to play a very positive role in very uh, difficult situations like the Gaza and the Palestinian uh, and the Israeli war and also the uh, Russian uh, Ukrainian war for example because otherwise without any meaningful uh, third party involvement to keep the combatants apart from each other uh, bring an end to the war and saving lives, especially women and children, then I think the world will be not as good as what we all of us want to have it. Uh, therefore, I think the United Nations peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping operations need to be more sophisticated and maybe moving in line with the changes in the world and also need to think bold as to what they can do to play a better role in uh, more difficult situations, including the two I just now mentioned. And I think China will do whatever it takes to make sure that the United Nations uh, peacekeeping forces will have a more meaningful role to play. Abdullahi, Africa is also the continent where uh, more than half of current peacekeeping operations are based. Um, when you look at the contribution that these peacekeeping operations are making to the the African continent. I mean, are they bringing stability to uh, those areas where they deployed? Yeah, I think uh, your question is valid to the extent that, you know, uh, I think there are active 10 peacekeeping of UN peacekeeping operations on the continent. But I think, like I said, at the top of the hour, there is a sense of jadedness, there is a sense of mismatch between expectations and the reality on the ground in the sense that uh, for majority of people who think that or expected at the very minimum that peacekeeping operation will bring them some stability, peace and security. Instead, some of the peacekeepers have been accused of participating in some of the egregious human rights violations, mm -hmm. including, you know, gender based violence in places like the DRC. But I think the largest question or the most critical question that is looming large over UN peacekeeping operation is the reality that most of the African countries are beginning to exert themselves. Uh, just be just because they are unstable, it doesn't mean that they forfeit their territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, but the other second element that is very important in the discussions around the peacekeeping operations is that <laughs> The world is not what it used to be when the initial peacekeeping operations were envisaged. And so majority of African countries, uh, especially the regional grouping, be it ECOWAS, be it the East African community, be it uh, the SADC, that is the South African uh, Development Corporations, they are thinking of deploying their own peacekeeping operations. For instance, in, in Somalia, uh, the UN peacekeeping uh, uh, operation is largely an African based, largely funded by the European Union, of course. Uh, you've, saw, you've seen the deployment of the East African standby force in the eastern part of the DRC. So there is a sense that African countries are not just only being part of the UN peacekeeping operation, and they should be, but also they are taking independent regional uh, actions that are bringing stability. But I think the sense is the UN peacekeeping operation, as it's currently done, has not failed, uh, to, has, not, has not lived to its expectations. Said, looking at some numbers from the United Nations, uh, they tell us that one quarter of humanity live in areas affected by conflict and there are about 108 million people who are currently displaced. You know, in one of my previous conversations with Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the Under Secretary at the UN, he said he hoped that his group, his organization, didn't have to exist, that he wouldn't have that job. But the reality is that job is needed. Um, but looking at those numbers, um, are we seeing more challenges now that make peacekeeping operations really indispensable? Absolutely. I, I, it, it's, uh, it's sad that here we are in, uh, in still the early part of the 21st century, mm -hmm. uh, and we have the kinds of conflicts which uh, seem to be intractable. Uh, the fact that some of these peacekeeping missions have such longevity uh, is, on the one hand, of course, uh, quite tragic. Uh, but yet at the same time, it uh, reaffirms uh, the very need for these peacekeeping forces to be deployed, uh, to be involved, but again, also to be supported 
uh, and not contravened, uh, not uh, to be undermined by other countries. And as you mentioned uh, quite rightly before, uh, the great power politics that seems to uh, plague so many of these theaters. Victor, uh, China is, of course, a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, and it is from that council that these mandates for peacekeeping flow. Um, will China push for more efforts and an, perhaps an effort to also streamline the process? Because we've seen how many uh, of these missions can be held up because of the powerful veto that these five members uh, wield at times. Exactly. I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, peacekeeping uh, operations of the United Nations really need to be further reformed in the direction of greater sophistication, greater efficiency, and a lower cost uh, to the extent possible, and a more widely uh, wider participation by more member states. Now, in this regard, I think we need to really be more creative. For example, looking at the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster, for example, uh, the world is stuck with a situation where the country may or may not be fully equipped to deal with that. Now, if UN-led peacekeeping forces will be equipped with some new tasks and new capabilities, then they can actually play a very indispensable role in future disasters like that, not only uh, conflicts among nations or among different parts of one uh, country, but also potential great catastrophes for mankind as a whole. But all of this cannot be done without serious consideration, without consensus among nations, especially among the United Nations uh, Security Council members, and also great audacity to think about what can be done. Because once the United Nations peacekeeping forces are employed, I think it rents greater authority and dignity to whatever that will be done and will create a greater expectation and greater certainty for the countries or the different parts of one country involved. And I hope this kind of authority and dignity can also play a very important role in, for example, um, unexpected uh, nuclear disasters, as well as other catastrophes that mankind eventually will need to be prepared yeah. to handle. Nothing can be better than the United Nations peacekeeping forces. Abdullahi, uh, very quickly, I've got less than a minute left, but one of the specific goals of the conference in Accra is to bolster the security of civilians. And they, if we look at the conflicts in Ukraine as well as in Gaza, especially in Gaza right now, I mean, there could be no greater need for that role for the UN peacekeeping mission as we see right now. I mean, do you ever see a time when the UN can deploy uh, its forces there to keep the peace to protect civilians? Yeah, I think the part of the multi-dimensional peacekeeping operation includes civilian protection, unlike just being the peacekeeping operation in the traditional sense. Yes, yeah. but I think with a massive caveat that major power rivalry, like you mentioned at the yeah. UN Security Council and elsewhere, is resolved. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C.